Welcome back, and hello again to those watching us around the world uh, via live streaming. We're going to resume our program, and if you remember from the morning, the, the premise, uh, the kind of framework of our agenda. So we um, tried to draw um, speakers from a variety of typologies, categories, types of cultural heritage. And we heard this morning about built heritage, buildings. Uh, we heard about archaeology. We heard about landscapes. Um, in the afternoon segment, we're going to be discussing cultural communities, the communities associated around cultural practices. We're going to hear about intangible cultural heritage. We're going to hear about museums and collections. And to kick off our afternoon program, we have Dr. Victoria Herman to talk about cultural communities. Victoria is the president and managing director of the Arctic Institute. She does research and writing, focusing on climate change, community adaptation, resilience development, and migration. She currently serves as the principal investigator of the National Science Foundation funded Arctic Migration in Harmony and Interdisciplinary Network on Literal Species Settlements and Culture on the Move, which is a major new uh, international initiative of the NSF. And she also has had a, a collaboration with the National Geographic called America's Eroding Edges. And so um, please join me in welcoming to the podium Dr. Victoria Herman. Victoria? Growing up amongst the smog-filled highways and shopping malls of northern New Jersey, I took comfort in knowing that the cathedrals America built to artists were just a stone's throw away. And on rare occasions, I could escape the sorrows of suburbia and travel to these altar-like galleries and see paintings and sculptures beyond my wildest imagination. Now, most of these museum trips were made from New Jersey to Manhattan by way of the Bronx. And it's there on a street of broken windows and forgotten histories that my family's factory has stood from one generation to the next. My father, welding here, and my grandfather, both Renaissance men of small business manufacturing, would wake me early on Sundays and take me to work. And as they welded in a dimly lit corner of the factory, I would settle down at his desk with a sketchbook and colored pencils and meticulously draw in Van Gogh's sunflowers. After hours and hours of attempting to shade these sunflowers in, the factory would settle again into a calm cold and the machines would resume their slumber. And finally, we would get to fulfill that early morning promise of a trip over the Harlem River to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. If I close my eyes, I can still touch the happiness that I felt as the three of us ascended those marble staircase and got lost in a picturing of the past. The most memorable of these trips, however, was not made because of some art-inspired experience. It was memorialized because of a conversation that happened in that car ride from the Bronx to Manhattan. As we all got into my father's van, I first noticed that there were numbers on my grandfather's forearm. 176924, inked unforgivingly into his skin. Is that a tattoo, I asked. Yes, he responded. Do you know what it's from? I shook my head. He took a deep breath and he smiled. It was on that car trip that I first learned what the Holocaust was. Growing up the grandchild of Auschwitz concentration camp survivors, you do not hear blissful stories of their youth. My family's history is filled with cattle cars and bloodstained streets, with refugee camps in France. Out of this family picture, my grandfather, the little boy on the left, was the only one to have survived. And yet, in spite of this, in spite of genocide, of forced displacement, of migration, 
my family's traditions proved resilient. Thousands of miles away from where my grandparents were born and two generations from nearly every branch of my family tree being exterminated, my life has been cradled by their cultural heritage. I still light candles every Friday night in celebration of good times, and I know that I can fall back on my cultural community in times of trouble. I'm able to do this because their cultural heritage was preserved and empowered in every step of their exodus. My grandparents' story was archived and documented in a visual history, interviews taken from Holocaust survivors that I can still access on YouTube. They used their faith, their food ways, and their music to build bridges between different cultures as immigrants to New York City. And in synagogues across the country, they found dwellings, physical spaces, to practice singing and dancing, traditions that I learned as a young child. The documentation of lost cultural heritage, the dialogue, bridge building between different cultural groups, and dwellings, those physical spaces to retain our cultural heritage, were key to my family's resilience, despite their displacement, their migration, and their relocation to the United States. Climate change impacts and the extreme weather events that climate change intensifies are today and will continue to be the greatest catalyst of migration worldwide and the biggest threat to cultural communities. In 2019, the Internally Displaced Center estimates that 22 million people worldwide were displaced within their own country borders from climate-induced extreme weather events, breaking a record for the past 100 years of displacement. The United States is not immune to climate displacement and migration. Last year, we experienced 14 $1 billion storms. Each of these came with families, neighborhoods, and communities that had to leave their culturally important landscapes, their place-based traditions, their identities behind in search of safer land. No matter what corner of this country you call home, whether it be the coasts or the mountains, the Great Lakes or the Great Plains, climate change is already causing forced migrations and irreplaceable cultural damage. In 2017, Hurricane Harvey made landfall as a Category 4 storm and displaced 30,000 people. In 2018, California saw its costliest, its deadliest, and its most catastrophic fire season in recorded history, displacing thousands of households that are still struggling to find a new home. And in 2019, inland flooding in the Midwest caused extreme flooding of historic farmlands, of river cities, and displaced not just households, but entire communities away from the rivers. 96% of counties in the United States have experienced an extreme weather event in the past five years alone. Every person is touched by climate change, by the displacement it causes, and the threats to cultural communities across America. I know because I've listened to those stories firsthand. In 2016 and 2017, my research partner Eli Keene and I traveled across the United States and US territories on a research project called America's Eroding Edges. Funded by National Geographic and partnered with the National Trust for Historic Preservation, we interviewed more than 350 local leaders to understand how climate change was impacting coastal communities 
and to understand what was needed at the local level to adapt to the climate impacts that we can no longer avoid. From Alaska to American Samoa, from Miami to Mississippi, we were shown how climate change is affecting cultural communities and the lack of support each of those mayors, those tribal leaders, those bank managers, those climate champions don't have in order to respond and be resilient. Now, when I began America's Eroding Edges, I'm going to be honest, I did not include cultural heritage in my research agenda. Despite being from a strong cultural community, I left that behind in my professional work. I was a climate change researcher. I had no idea that all of you existed, <laughs> that there was this nexus between climate change and cultural heritage. But as I began asking people what was impacted most from climate change, they quickly moved past the answers I expected of economic loss and infrastructure damage to instead talk about how climate change was disrupting their cultures, their historic sites, their languages, their place-based traditions, their identities. In Anu'u American Samoa, Peter Taliva showed me how taro fields were being inundated by salt water, killing this staple cultural food that is not only used for everyday meals, but cultural ceremonies. Peter shared a fear that his community has of a need to abandon their current village and move to the mainland of American Samoa once all the taro has died. In Miami, community advocate and PhD candidate Keelan Ashad Bishop showed me how little Haiti was being affected by the storm impacts to the multi-billion dollar waterfront a few miles away, as there are more extreme storms and sea level rise impacting Miami's waterfront and Miami Beach, developers are starting to eye little Haiti, causing a nexus of climate change and gentrification displacement. And in the native village of Teller, Alaska, Mayor Blanche Obanik Garney showed me how erosion and thawing permafrost, the melting of the very frozen ground upon which the village is built, is not just impacting generations of her family's graves, but is impacting her current family's home. Teller is one of 31 villages across the state of Alaska that the Army Corps of Engineers has identified as being in need of immediate relocation because of flooding and erosion. From thousands of stories and hundreds of interviews across our country, the one unavoidable takeaway is this. Climate change at its core is a story about the looming reality of losing the very things that make us who we are. So I want us to stop and think about this for a moment because I can continue up here telling you about communities I work with in the Arctic or the South Pacific, but chances are most of you in this auditorium don't readily work or live in the Arctic or the South Pacific. So instead, I'm going to ask you to think about who you are. And more specifically, I want you to think about a place that is important to you. So I want you to all close your eyes, and this is a little dangerous right after lunch, so please stay with me. <laughs> close your eyes and think about a place that is important to you and your cultural community. Think about the people that you know there, the experiences, that you've had. For me, I'm thinking back to my grandfather and my father, and this social hall that's tucked away behind trees and next to a babbling brook in North Jersey. It's where I first learned to braid hala as a child with my grandmother, 
It's where I met my best friend 25 years ago. It's where just a couple of months ago, my siblings and I returned home to celebrate my father's contributions to our community. It's a place filled with friends and neighbors that have supported me my entire life. Does everyone have that place? Good. Now, I want you to erase that place from the map. It is no longer there. Not only can you never return to it, but you can never bring your children, your spouse, your friends to that place. And those people that made up your cultural community are dispersed all across the country. They are no longer your neighbors that you can ask to walk your dog. They're no longer there to come over for a Friday night dinner and celebrate your achievements. They're everywhere, and your cultural community is nowhere. Too often, we in 2020 forget how the places that matter most to us define who we are. We're mobile, and that's a good thing. We leave to go to college, to get new jobs, to follow a love, and we lose ourselves in the melting pot of cities or find new homes in new states or countries. And all of this movement is a good thing. It makes us adaptable to change and exposes us to a diversity of cultures. But through all of that movement, we have in the back of our head that place that we can always go back to, whether it's once a year for a holiday or every 10 years, just to remind ourselves it is there. There will come a time in the not so distant future where that place for you will be impacted by climate change beyond saving. The loss and damage of cultural heritage that comes from climate change disrupts our connection to the places that define our cultural communities. The dislocation between cultural community and place-based identity creates a short-term demoralizing, demoralizing sense for action and a long-term struggle to regain resilience. Severing place and community means that you are severing a community to their local and traditional knowledge that will help them adapt and be resilient to shock events. Dislocating a community to their place-based identity means that you are weakening those cultural practices like food, faith, and music that help build, that help build friendships in new places. And when you lose cultural heritage and you cannot return to it, you might be unsure what to pass down to the next generation where your stories reside. And climate change is not race, gender, or income neutral. All of these impacts disproportionately affect low-income communities, communities of color, and women, all of whom have seen economic, political, and environmental injustice for centuries that have limited their ability to create resources to respond to and prepare for forced displacement and migration from climate impacts. But there is some good news in all of this. Because as I traveled across the country, I also found hundreds of climate change heroes in every place that I went. Every community already had a vision for resilience, for what their future looked like in a climate-changed world. But what they voiced was a lack of support, a lack of funding to document cultural loss and damage, a lack of support for spaces to have dialogue between displaced communities and those who would receive them a lack of support from libraries and museums to house their cultural assets and to keep them alive in the process of migration. 
It's those three areas, documentation, dialogue, and dwellings, that I'm working on today. In partnership with the National Trust for Historic Preservation, and with partnerships with cultural organizations across the country, I've created a skills-based volunteering platform that connects pro bono experts like everyone in this room with community champions in need of support. We're connecting people for one-hour conversations to answer specific questions to fully-fledged projects of cultural resource and climate change management plans for a building or a historic district. Within this, we have run a series of dialogue workshops in Louisiana with the Lowlander Center that brings lowland community leaders in conversation with inland communities that are receiving those displaced residents around food, faith, and music to build friendships and to build resilience in climate migration. In partnership with National Geographic, I get to work with middle and high school students across the country on photo camps, week-long excursions in Alaska and the Mississippi Delta where we get to work with students, train them in photography, and then give the cameras over to them for a week to document cultural loss and damage from climate change, and also cultural resilience and adaptation to those changes. And with funding from the American Geophysical Union and a partnership with the Boys and Girls Club in American Samoa, we are creating shared spaces for gardens and for cultural exchange between American Samoans and other islanders across the South Pacific who have been displaced by storms and have come to the island. Each of these programs is meaningful, but they are all ad hoc. To truly support resilient climate migration and cultural communities in an era of climate displacement, we must allocate resources to the documentation, enablement, and housing of cultural heritage at every step of the migration process. We have to make sure that there are resources to lift up and cradle those heritage, traditions, languages, and identities no matter when the next storm comes. Ahead of this talk, I took a brief survey of current climate policies in America's major cities, in states, and a few counties. I did not find a single example where a policy addressed climate migration and cultural heritage. So this is where all of you come in, because I need every single person in this auditorium to be at the decision-making table at your organization, at your museum, at your county, at your city, at your state, at the national conversation to make sure that we are supporting cultural heritage and cultural communities in climate displacement and migration. Now, all of you have come here, and that's an incredible first step. We've spent the morning learning about historic buildings and landscapes and architecture, and we will continue that conversation tomorrow in our breakout groups. But it's time to reach further. It is not good enough to be here and listen. You have to be part of our climate heritage solution. And so, I have a bit of homework for everyone. My professor is now coming out. When you leave this auditorium, maybe when you leave DC and go back home, I need you to do five things. The first, identify how climate change and climate migration intersect with your work. Have you thought about climate displacement in your geography, in your hometown? Have you thought about if your city is going to receive climate displaced individuals or communities? Have you thought about what your organization, your museum, your firm is doing to empower those cultural communities and to uplift their heritage? Now, once you've identified that, I want you to act. I want you to think and commit 
to context-wise solutions to climate migration and cultural communities in a warming world. And hopefully, we'll help you along in point two tomorrow in our breakout groups. If you need a bit more help once you leave this auditorium, reach out on the Rise Up to Rising Tides platform and connect with someone else for an hour-long conversation or for a project to build climate solutions together. Or if you are already pioneering a climate solution, sign up to be a volunteer to pass it forward and help another community. And finally, there is strength in numbers. If every person in this room reaches out to five people once they leave to bring the climate heritage and migration story to them, we can reach hundreds of Americans across this country and build a more resilient framework for climate migrants. When the next storm or fire hits, maybe as early as this summer, there will be hundreds of Americans that are displaced, that will be disconnected from their historic sites, from their culturally important landscapes, from their important archeological sites. They might be dispersed as a cultural community. We cannot afford to wait. The displacements that I showed at the beginning of this talk, the ones that we could expect in 2020, are just the beginning. By the end of this century, 13 million Americans will be displaced from America's coastlines by sea level rise alone. That does not account for extreme weather events like inland flooding or wildfires. Now, when I say that 13 million Americans will be displaced and we think about those charts on where we are trajected to be, it might feel a little bit hopeless and helpless. I know I feel a little bit hopeless every time I read a climate story in the newspaper. But hope is a future-oriented emotion. We can feel hopeless today and still be hopeful about the future. And I think about my family's story and how even in the darkest of times, they were able to find that light, to find that hope around their cultural community, to shelter it and to pass it on to me. Next month, I will commemorate the people, the cultures, and the communities that we lost 75 years ago in the Holocaust. Usually, on Holocaust Remembrance Day, I'll go to a handful of local events here in DC and listen to the stories of survivors. And I'll go on YouTube and re-watch my grandfather's own testimony. This passing down of stories from one generation to the next is known in Hebrew as Lador Vador. In a word, it means resilience. This is what we as a community here need to build for every cultural community. We need to make sure that Lador Vador, that resilience is embedded in every climate policy, from the Green New Deals in Los Angeles and New York to the global conventions that we are creating as humanity. We cannot afford climate silence from anyone in the climate heritage movement. The cost, the threats to our diverse cultural communities in this country, in this world, the loss that we face is far too high. When I leave this stage, when all of you leave this room, I need everyone to commit to being a climate change hero. Thank you.